Let's see how much of astrophysics or space and lenses we can fit on one piece of paper. I'm going to be starting off inside the box with just GCSC stuff, and then I'm going to add the A-level stuff around the outside. You can download the full and GCSE versions of this mind map in PDF form from scienceshorts.net. Let's start off with the life cycle of stars. Now the theory goes that a star will form from a nebula, that's a cloud of gas and dust massive massive cloud that is gravity will make the particles be attracted to each other and they'll become more and more densely packed and the temperature will rise until a protostar is formed that's a baby star that's when fusion starts hydrogen will get fused together into helium in my example it's heavy hydrogen or deuterium and then the heliums will go on to fuse and so on and so forth for most of a star's life it's in what we call the main sequence and that's when it's just burning away nicely it's not actually burning is it it's just doing fusion and it doesn't get smaller or bigger because the pressure from fusion pushing outwards and the force of gravity pulling inwards are balanced. But once the hydrogen starts to run out, we only have the bigger nuclei fusing and that actually makes more energy. And so the star will start to expand. If it's a similar size to our sun, then it will become just a red giant. But if it's bigger, then it can become a super red giant. And they're kind of the same thing, it's just what happens next that is different. Once the fuel runs out, a red giant will just implode to make a white dwarf, and then once completely spent, it'll turn into a black dwarf. And that will be mostly iron, because iron is the most stable element out there. However, if it's a super red giant, then it will implode so violently, that actually it creates an explosion afterwards. This is what we call a supernova, and this can actually make elements heavier than iron. And the outer layers will just drift off and then make a nebula, but the center will just implode implode and make either a neutron star or if it's even more dense it'll make a black hole and that's when gravity is so strong that not even light can escape okay circular motion in order for circular motion to happen like the moon or an artificial satellite going around a planet the force the centripetal force we call it needs to be perpendicular 90 degrees to the velocity at all times that means that the force is not increasing or decreasing the speed it's just changing the direction of the velocity so technically a satellite will always be accelerating towards the earth it just won't get any closer we have two main different types of artificial satellites we have ones that are in a low polar orbit they are obviously low they go very fast around the earth they orbit from north pole to south pole and because they're nice and low we can use them to take images of the earth and we also use them for gps and seeing what the weather's doing then we have a geosynchronous or geostationary orbit i've drawn it around this planet in the center let's pretend that it's the earth though the time it takes to do one circle one orbit that's also called the period is the same as the planet's rotation so that means for a geostationary satellite around the earth it will take 24 hours to go around that means that it will stay above the same position on the earth at all times and the only place that you can do that is at the equator so we have a big ring of satellites above the equator and we use these for like television signals and communications because it's easy to target them because they're in the same place because they're further away they're going slower okay big bang theory there are two main pieces of evidence for this one is redshift that's galaxies appear redshifted. The wavelengths of light and EM that they emit seem to be stretched. That means they're moving away from us. But this is the important bit, that the ones that are further away are moving faster away from us because they're more redshifted. So this suggests that they all originated from the same place at the beginning of the universe. The second piece of evidence is CMBR, or Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. If we look deep into space, we can see microwaves being emitted from all directions. It suggests that the Big Bang is still going and we're just looking at the edge of it. Black body radiation. Black body is an ideal object that emits and absorbs all wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation and a star is pretty close to being a black body. If you draw a graph of what energy emitted compared to wavelength looks like classical physics predicts that as we get to shorter wavelengths the energy should increase dramatically but in reality we see that it comes back down and that's due to quantum effects and the dip happens at around uv ultraviolet wavelengths so it's called the ultraviolet catastrophe okay let's go on to lenses here's your classic ray diagram we have the lens at a level you'll probably just see a dotted line the line in the middle of the lens we can call the lens axis and the line that goes perpendicular through the lens we call that the principal axis and the first dot on the line is called the principal focus the distance from the lens to it is called the focal length that's specific to a lens that is where all the rays will converge if they're coming from an object infinitely far away that means that the rays are going parallel into the lens 
Now, in order to find out where an image is formed, what we do is draw two rays from the top of the object. Some people say draw three, but you only need two in reality. So what you do is draw one that goes parallel to the principal axis into the lens, and then that goes through the principal focus. And then your second ray just goes straight through the center of the lens. And then where those two meet up, that's where the image of the top of the object is gonna be formed. So this is what the image of the arrow is gonna look like. This is how big it is. And we have F on the object side of the lens and also double that length, 2F as well, very important. Usually you'll see an object represented by just an arrow because you can see which way up it is. And we have the object distance, then we have the object height, and we have the image distance and image height as well. And we can see that these rays are actually converging, they're meeting. So that means that we can project this image if we put a screen at this point where the image is, then we can see the image of the arrow. So we call this a real image because it can be projected. However, if the rays do not converge, then we end up with a virtual image. The rays meet on the wrong side of the lens, so they don't actually meet in reality. A convex lens can make both real and virtual images, but a concave lens can't make real images. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Magnification of the lens is equal to the image height divided by the object height, or the image distance divided by the object distance. Okay, convex lens, the most common lens. If the object is further than 2F away from the lens, like the example above, then the image produced is real. It's also inverted because it's the other way up, and it's also diminished, that means it's smaller than the object. However, if the object is between F and 2F, then we're gonna get a real image again, inverted again, but this time it's going to be magnified it's going to be bigger however something weird happens if the object is close to the lens than f we end up with a virtual image that ends up being upright and magnified I've drawn a very small version of it here the rays from the top of the arrow will diverge as they go out of the lens but if we extrapolate those two rays backwards we can see where they do meet in theory on the wrong side of the lens as it were and so we can see where this virtual image is going to be formed what's the point of this well if these diverging rays go into your eye then you can see this virtual image because the lens in your eye is making them converge in the end so you see the arrow as bigger so this is what would happen with a magnifying glass for example that's it for GCSE, let's go on to just A level. Let's go back up to redshift. The amount of redshift is given by the letter Z. That's equal to recessional velocity. That's how fast a galaxy is going relative to us, divided by the speed of light. This only works if it is much smaller than the speed of light. I'm not dealing with minuses or anything here. I'm just talking about the magnitude. The magnitude of the redshift is also equal to the difference in frequency between the redshifted frequency and the normal frequency divided by the normal frequency. And that also goes for wavelength as well. Here's the Hubble graph. If we draw a graph of v against d for some reason i've put c i'll fix that in a couple of minutes we can see that the further galaxies are away from us d the faster the recessional velocity v so we can see that most galaxies line up along this line and so we have a constant the gradient is equal to the hubble constant and the unit of that is seconds to the minus one so therefore the age of the universe theoretically is given by the reciprocal of that black body radiation i've just drawn it the same again but i've also drawn a dotted line to show what would happen if we have an object at a higher temperature the peak goes up and to the left. Now that peak wavelength can give us the temperature of a star according to Vian's law. Lambda max times the temperature in Kelvin is equal to 0 0.0029. For telescopes we can calculate magnification two more ways as well. First way is just by taking the angle that an object covers or subtends when we look at it through a telescope and divide that by the angle that it subtends when we're just looking at it with the naked eye. This only works if we're dealing with very small angles and we have to be in radians as well. A refracting telescope consists of an objective lens and an eyepiece lens because the rays come in parallel and we want them to go out parallel as well that means that we have a point between the two lenses where the rays all meet that means the length of the telescope is going to be equal to the focal length of the objective lens plus the focal length of the eyepiece lens and actually magnification is given by f0 divided by fe2 Cassie grain is a type of reflecting telescope. We have this parabolic curve, the light comes in and then it goes onto this secondary mirror, which reflects it into the eyepiece. Yeah, sure, we are blocking some of the light with that secondary mirror, but it's inconsequential when it comes to the overall light that is going into the whole telescope. And the good thing about reflecting telescopes is that we don't get chromatic aberrations. We do get that with refracting telescopes because different wavelengths of light have different refractive indexes. We don't get spherical aberration either if it's parabolic parabolic, which they should be. We get no distortion, we get a higher resolving power, and also we get a brighter image. Speaking of resolving power, this indicates how good a telescope is at distinguishing between two objects. And so we can also think of it as resolution in terms of angles. This is given by Raleigh's criterion. Theta in radians is equal to the wavelength of light divided by the diameter 
of the telescope or the aperture. That's just the size of the hole that the light goes through. A CCD is a charge coupled device, and that's the sensor that we have in, well, pretty much everything nowadays, isn't it? Quantum efficiency of a CCD is equal to the number of photons detected compared to the number of photons going into it, number of photons incident, and then, yeah, times by 100. With a CCD, we have photons going in, and we have the photoelectric effect. Electrons will absorb the photons and be liberated. And the more electrons that are liberated from a pixel in a CCD, the more light we know is going into it. And these electrons get trapped in a potential well. And then we can measure this and then build up a picture. Gathering power, just the amount of power that's going into a telescope, is going to be proportional to the area of the telescope. And so is going to be proportional to the diameter squared or the radius squared of the telescope. And for some reason, I forgot to write the Hubble equation up there. We know that V equals H0 times D. Apparent magnitude is an old school way of thinking about brightness of stars. It goes from one to six, where one is brightest and six is dimmest, and M1 is 100 times brighter, more intense than M of six. Then we can see that M1 is 2.51 times brighter than M2 which is 2.51 times brighter than M3, etc. Talk about magnitude a little bit more in a second. The intensity of light that reaches us is equal to the luminosity of a star divided by four pi r squared, luminosity being the complete power output of a star and divided by the area of the imaginary sphere that we're sitting at the edge of. Okay, the lens equation is one over the focal length is equal to one over the object distance plus one over the image distance. Power of a lens is not normal power, it's just the reciprocal of the focal length. And so the unit is meters to the minus one, but that has its own special name, that's diopter, capital D. Here's the equation for apparent magnitude. The difference in apparent magnitude between two stars is equal to minus 2.51 times the log of the ratio of intensities. Absolute magnitude, trying to make it a little bit more objective. This is what the apparent magnitude of a star would be if it was at the arbitrary distance of 10 parsecs away from us. And I'll remind you what the definition of a parsec is at the end. And here's the equation that gives that. Apparent magnitude minus absolute magnitude is equal to five times the log of the distance in parsecs divided by 10. Schwarzschild or Schwarzschild radius gives you the radius of the event horizon of a black hole. It's equal to 2 gm over c squared. Closer than this radius, the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. Luminosity and temperature of a star are linked by Stefan's law. Luminosity equals sigma, that's the Stefan or Stefan Boltzmann constant, times the surface area of the star, times the surface temperature of the star to the power of four. Here's our no doubt politically incorrect mnemonic to help us remember the seven main classes of stars. Oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. O being the hottest at 25,000 to 50,000 Kelvin and M being the coolest at under 3,500 Kelvin. Here's the HR or Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of luminosity against temperature. We're actually getting cooler as we go to the right though. And we have the curve going down and to the right. That's where our main sequence stars are found. Bottom left, we have white dwarfs that are pretty hot, but not very bright. They are the Love Island contestant version of stars. And then up top right, we have where the giants are, your red giants and super red giants. And then here's that definition for what a parsec is. It's short for parallax second. It is the distance at which one astronomical unit, that's just the mean radius of the Earth's orbit around the Sun, subtends one arc second. That's one three thousand six hundredth of a degree. One more thing is that if you see an absorption spectrum that seems to be splitting into two and then recombining every so often, you're probably looking at a binary star. We're looking at it end on in line with the orbit of these two stars around a common center of gravity. And we're getting the shift in wavelength because the recessional velocities are changing as they come towards us and go away from us periodically. So there are all the fundamental bits of astrophysics. There's always more detail that you could go into when thinking about these things, but these are the main ideas that you need to remember for your exam. If you found this helpful, leave a like. If you think I've missed anything, put it in a comment down below and I'll see if I can add it to the PDF. If you want to test your knowledge on this stuff, then click on the cards and it'll take you to my flashcard questions. See you there.